Revelation chapter number 12. We left off last week at the end of chapter number 11. You'll remember that the temple of God was opened in heaven. We saw that the four and twenty elders heard that the seventh trumpet had blown. They fell down before the throne of God. They worshipped, they exalted, they praised. And then we saw even the earth's response to hearing that God was coming back, that that seventh trumpet had been sounded. Well, chapter number 12. It says, There appeared a great wonder in heaven. What's a wonder? Well, a wonder is something magnificent. It's something too great to wrap your head around. right? It's something that you can't figure out. A wonder is something that you never could have seen coming. Right? Didn't they say that Jesus' name would be called Wonderful in Isaiah? Capital W? Why? Because even half of it's only been told that we have access to on all that Jesus did for you. There's another half that it's been written, but it hadn't been given to us yet. It's in heaven. Right? You start to think of how wonderful Jesus is, and then just think, you don't even know the half of it. Because in truth, we don't know how wonderful he is in this book. It's only by the grace of God we understand what we do. Right? Well, here's just another wonder in heaven. It says, A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with, jo- with child, cried, travailing in birth, in pain to be delivered. Now, as we keep going on, this woman in the wilderness that the apostle John is making reference to that would be the nation of Israel okay that's God's chosen people okay if you study your Bible in the Old Testament the bride or so to speak the wife of God the one that he made the covenant to was the nation of Israel what's that crown with the 12 stars on her head that's the 12 tribes of Israel Well, in the New Testament, the bride of Christ is the church. So this bride is the bride for Jehovah God. The bride of Christ would be the New Testament church. Okay, keep that in mind. But, it says that she being with with child cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. Two things. One, she did deliver a child called Jesus but also this woman right arrayed with the sun the moon beneath her feet 12 stars on the crown she also has many children right to give birth to during the great tribulation who's that that's 144,000 that we've been talking about well it says that she travails with this one says that she's in she's struggling to deliver this one what does that mean she needs help right i wouldn't know because one not a woman two never gonna get pregnant but even in bible days there were handmaids there were uh delivery nurses uh nowadays they got a whole bunch of funky names for them i think doula is one of them right but well, those were people that would come to your house that would help you deliver. They were experts or they were seasoned in the fact on how to give birth. They didn't have ERs and they didn't have doctors and they didn't have delivery wards. Well, here in this verse it says she pained to be delivered. She was travailing in birth. What to say? She's crying for help. This isn't the easiest delivery in the world. This delivery is going to take some assistance. Okay? What it says in verse number 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had the place prepared of God that they should 
feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Well, another wonder in heaven. Is that not what it says in verse number three? This is another picture. Keep in mind, book of Revelation, the apostle John's giving it to us as he gets it. He's recording what God says to record, and he's not recording what God says not to record. Go back two chapters, and you'll see that the angel don't, don't record what the voice of the seven thunder said. What's he writing down? What God wants you to see. What's he leaving out? What God doesn't want you to see. The first wonder is that there was a woman travailing in birth. What she looked like? She looked like the bride of Jehovah, Israel. Then there's a second wonder. Some of it is past. Some of it in this second wonder is present. What's the past part? Well, we're going to find out here in a second who this red dragon is. Spoiler, it, that, it's the devil. Okay, Satan. But it says, There appeared another wonder, and, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. What's he trying to do? He's trying to copy and imitate the Lord. Go back and look at the description of the Lamb. Okay. But it says having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew a, a, the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to earth. Who's that? Those are the angels that sided with Lucifer rather than with God when Satan tried to usurp the throne of Christ and the throne of God. It says, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Singular child. Again, this is past tense. As John's writing this, this was, oh, roughly 60 years after Jesus had gone back to glory. So what's he saying? Well, about 90 years ago, give or take, there was one who was delivered. His name was Christ. But that red dragon was circling the woman, Israel, looking for an opportunity to what? Destroy, devour, defeat Christ. Just one problem. He couldn't do it. It says, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Y'all remember when Herod had the slaughter of the innocents? You think that was any accident? No, he was trying to get him when he was defenseless and helpless as a babe. He wasn't ever defenseless or helpless. But Lucifer said, if I got a shot, it's going to have to be when he's a babe. He never had a shot to begin with. But it says in verse number 5, And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. What happened? The devil couldn't do it. Jesus lived among men for some 30 years. Okay. Then, for about three and a half years, he and 11 disciples and another one that was of the devil turned the world upside down. Doing what? Just being Jesus. Seeking to save that which was lost. Coming to restore what was fallen. Right? Having compassion on others. But when he was finished, did the devil get him? Nope. He rose victorious over death and hell. He has the keys to both. The devil doesn't even have the keys to his own house. But it says here that the child, which later was a man, caught up into heaven. And notice, it says caught up unto God, capital G, and to his throne. Either way you read that, you know what that means? That child's got a throne in heaven. There's only one person got a throne in heaven. That's God. So without a doubt, chapter number, or verse number 5, talking about Jesus and when he was delivered. Verse number 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness. This is present tense, as he's seeing this in the span of the end times. The tribulation the great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, as the Old Testament would call it. Verse number 6 picks up during the tribulation. Okay, verse number 5, past tense, talking about Jesus. Okay, verse number 4 and verse number 3, when did that happen? I don't know when Lucifer rebelled against the Lord. 
Don't know when he tried to use her, but it happened a long time ago. But verse number 6 gets us caught up to now. Ever since Christ was born on the earth, you know what the devil's been trying to do? You know what he's trying to do before that and since? Wipe God's people off the map. Many times the Lord allowed them to suffer judgment by captivity under another country or subjugation by another country. Sometimes God judged his own people. Right, go back and look at Moses when he led him out of Egypt. He said, who's on the Lord's side? Those that weren't didn't make it any further. But regardless of what the name of the person that was trying to destroy him, nowadays it's called Palestine and Gaza and the Arab alliance that's trying to stir up against them. That's nothing new. You know who's directing all that? That red dragon. Because ever since, she's a reminder that God, she being Israel, is a reminder that God did something special. Do you think the Holocaust was just orchestrated by one man named Hitler? No. Long before the Holocaust happened, people hated the Jewish people. Long before World War I happened, where Germany got into all that debt, which is why Hitler was so angry all the time, he just blamed the Jewish people for being the ones that took advantage of the economic situation. Okay? Long before World War I, guess what? People have been trying to persecute the Jews and scatter them and drive them out, wipe them off the map. You know why that is? Because of verse number 6. The devil chased her into what? Hiding. And for thousands of years, long before Jesus came, Israel didn't have a place that they could call their own. They didn't have a home. They had lost the promised land, which was just a, you know, what they have now, just a fraction on the map. But they lost what God had intended them to have. Why? Because of their disobedience. So when persecution comes, they have no stronghold. They have no place where they can wall up and say, ha ha, you can't get in. They have to go on the run. It says that the devil chases her into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God. You know where they're going to go to? They're going to go to the place that God wants them to be. And if they get there, guess what? Well, first off, before we get there, it was a place prepared of God that they should feed her there 1,203 score days. Go back and do the math. Three and a half years. For half of the tribulation period, this woman, the nation of Israel, is going to be on the run for three and a half years, have no place to call their own. Where are they going to be? They're going to be, in the, they're going to be off the map, off the grid. To a place where God's prepared, where he'll take care of them for all three and a half years. But it says in verse number 7, and there was a war in heaven. Now we're back to past tense. Okay? War in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was there found any more place in heaven. Well, some people say, well, how come that's not the battle of Armageddon? One, because it tells you where it took place at, in heaven. Battle of Armageddon is taking place on earth. Okay? in the valley of Megiddo. That's not in heaven. We're going back to past tense. I only find that this is the one account where God did any kind of fighting against the Lucifer, but he didn't do it himself. He just told his other angels, go get them. God didn't even have to lift a finger to defeat the devil. It says, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. What happened? They fought themselves into a corner. Lucifer and a third of the angels in heaven fought. They got the butts handed to them. And then it says that there was found no place for them in heaven. They not only fought themselves out of their old positions, they fought themselves out of their old home. So God made them a new one. Does it not say that the Bible says that hell was a place reserved for the devil and his angels? 
God made them a place. It was a place of torment to inflict punishment upon them for rebelling against God. It says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, and was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Well, they got the butts kicked, and then they got the butt kicked out the house. That's what that verse says. But since he got kicked out, go read the first couple of chapters of the book of Job. There came a day that the sons of God were before the throne of God, sons being plural. What's that mean? Angels. His hierarchy in heaven. We know that Lucifer before he fell was the minister of music. Right? We know that the cherubim, what are they? They're the guards to God's throne. You don't approach God unless them fellas let you. Right? Don't mess with the cherubim. You've got the seraphim, right? But they praise God. Fly around his throne. There are different positions in glory. Well, what are they, Brother John? I don't know. God didn't tell us all of them. But there was a day that God set aside that there was a roll call. They were giving their reports to the Lord. Lord, we blessed you every second of every day that we could for the past however many years. Right, Lord, heaven's still as beautiful as it ever was. Well, Lucifer sneaks in. Well, why is he getting an audience? Because God allowed it. But the Lord asked him, what you been up to? He said, been walking to and fro, up and down in the earth. What was he doing? He was taking notes. He was looking for a reason that he could bring somebody up to God to prove how they were just as wicked as he was so that they would be condemned to hell with him. Did not Peter say that he was a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour? You think he's just walking around pouting all the time? No, he's looking for people that he could say, Hey, God, they're just like me. They deserve the same fate that I do. You know why he was standing close to the woman ready to devour the child that she delivered? Because he was our deliverer. He was our salvation. In fact, through Christ, we become everything that Lucifer ever desired to be. We're a joint heir with God. It says, which deceiveth the whole world in verse number 9. Now we're back to present tense. What's he been doing since Adam and Eve in the garden? Deceiving. Lying. Twisting the word of God. Manipulating the things of God. To what? To blind the eyes of men spiritually. To give them false hope. You know where religion comes from? The pits of hell. All religion will do is keep you lost. Religion's what you can do. Religion is based around the acts that you can do for God. We can do nothing for God in and of ourselves. Religion, according to the Bible, makes somebody twofold a child of hell. Why? Because you give them false hope. And they have to be convinced by God that what they have is not real and what they need is Christ. Religion won't do anything for you, but faith will. Christ will. Religion was made up by man. Well, where'd they get the idea from? The devil. He's always been twisting, perverting, giving... The people that were building the Tower of Babel, where'd they get the idea that they could build a tower that would go to the very throne of God? Where'd that stupid idea come from? Well, from pride. Pride. But who do you think put the thought in their head? We're pretty good at building. I bet you we could build a tower that goes all the way to heaven. Dumb. But, where do you think all that started? Lucifer. The lie from the beginning is that man can become like God. That's what he told Eve in the garden. Oh, God knows if you eat that fruit that you'll become as God's knowing the difference between good and evil. I think it would have been a much better life to just know what good was and never know what evil was. And really, I can understand the idea that I walk with God every day. I love Him. I desire to be like Him. 
Why wouldn't I want to be a God like God? There's just one problem. They were already made in His image and perfect. That's as close to God as they's ever going to get. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying that since the beginning, Satan's been deceiving people. And by this time, where all the world has turned against Israel, what's it? he's finally deceived the whole world at once. Everybody left on the face of the earth at this point in time, they've completely bought in hook, line, and sinker. They've all become the enemies of Israel, and they're united in one purpose. What's that? To find her out in the wilderness and to destroy her. Okay, verse number 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven, or a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of earth and to the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth he persecuted the woman which had brought forth the man child. And the woman and to the woman were given two things or two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into a place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Well, verse number 10 says, Now has come salvation and strength. Who's he talking about? He's talking about for the 144,000. He's talking about for that woman in the wilderness. By this point, if you saved by the blood of the Lamb, where are you at? You're in heaven already when all this is happening. Right? You've already been raptured, raptured out of here. You don't have to go through the great tribulation. But it says that those regardless of when they overcame the devil, they all did it through the same thing. It says in verse number 11, they overcame him, talking about the devil, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto the, the death. First off, what did it take to finally pay for the sins of man? The blood of the Lamb. That was the payment for sin. It says, and by the word of their testimony. Doesn't Romans chapter number 10 tell us that with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth repentance is made? unto salvation your testimony is the very fact that you stood up and identified with Christ nobody ever gets saved without asking God to save them and I believe if anybody gets saved they're going to talk different their life's going to look different after they got saved because God makes in them a new creature if you're born into the family you're going to start acting like the family you're going to look like the family you're going to have the attributes of the family. Why do you think I'm so honorary? I get it from my dad. What are you saying, Brother George? Well, they got in through the blood, but then their lives identified with God. That's what's talking about the word of their testimony. It says, They love not their lives unto the death. You know the reason that somebody won't get saved? Simply it comes down to they just don't put their faith in Jesus. But why don't they do that? Because they're not willing to lose what they have to gain what God said that they would receive. Did not Jesus say that if any man wanted to follow him, wanted to hook up with him, that he'd have to lose his life to gain the life that Christ offered him? You've got to reject the old man. You've got to be willing to crucify who you were in order to become what God wants you to be. If any man loves his life so much, he'll lose it. When's he going to lose it? In death. When's he going to lose it? Well, we've already talked about the lake of fire being the second death. 
But see, those that said, Lord, I don't, I'm not much. And I understand that I'm not proud of who I am because who I am caused your son to die on the cross for me. But Lord, if you saved me, sure would appreciate it. Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Or you can just pray what Jordan prayed when he got saved. It was, please save me, please save me, please save me. I remember that clear as day. You say, was that... Where'd you get that prayer, Brother Jordan? It came from the heart. You're not going to find that in any, you know, one, two, three, repeat after me thing. You have to say all of these words in this order. Hogwash. People have been getting saved every which way since Jesus died on the cross. You know what all of them had in common? For by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not of works. You know what saying a specific prayer is? Works. God's not in vain babblings and repetitions. You know what He's in? Sincerity. You know, it took for you to be saved. You had to repent of what you were and ask Jesus to save you. Believing that He would. What were you, you know, really, if we were to zoom out and we were to see in God's point of view, when you prayed to get saved, you know what you were saying? You were saying, Lord, take my old life, kill it. That's what a baptism is. It's a picture of what Jesus did in your life. You were buried with him in death and then risen again in new life as the new creature. The water is still water when you get pulled out, but you know what it symbolizes? You left the old man in the grave, in the tomb. He gave you victory over what you used to be so you could become what God wants you to be. Everybody that's overcome Satan, because I hate to break this to you, None of us is stronger than him. He's smarter. He's more subtle, more cunning. Not anybody that says, well, I could whip the devil. Good luck. He could do this. It was the ark, you know, the ark of archangels in glory. Go look and see what any one of just a normal angel could do in a night when God sent them down to do something for them in the Old Testament. You really think you could take one of them, let alone the one that was in charge of everything in glory right below God? No. I didn't say that you couldn't overcome I'm just saying you can't do it on your own. How'd you do it? Through the blood of the Lamb, through your testimony, and through losing your old self and embracing new life. It says, Therefore ye heavens, Rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. What's that short time? That's tribulation period. He's got a very little bit of time to finally do the one thing that he's always wanted to do. What's that? Wipe God's people off the map. The only one that he's got access to anymore is that woman in the wilderness. Where's the rest of them at, Brother Jordan? We in glory already. The Old Testament saints, the New Testament saints. The only ones left are the 144,000 that if we go back to the seals being opened, had the seal of the Lord in their forehead. They were marked by an angel. What's he trying to do? He's trying to find them. He's going to tear this world upside down. Looking every which way he can for him. Guess what? Not going to find him. Why? Because God prepared a place for him. It says, verse number 13, when the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth. Right now, the devil's got a little bit of leeway. We've already told you. He can, he's the accuser of the brethren. These verses told us he accuses day and night before the Lord. He doesn't give up. He's persistent. He's trying to find a loophole where he can say that God did something wrong or God wasn't just or that by us being associated with God, we make God lesser. He's lost every argument. He's never won one. You'd think he'd have given up by now. How many thousands of years has it been? No, but he's still at it. Then the Lord says, you're contained or caged to earth right now. That's all you got. 
Well, he's got a short time. He's stuck here on the face of the earth. What's it say he does in verse number 13? He persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. He couldn't get the child, so he's going to take it out on the woman that brought the child. It says they were given to the and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness and into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. But he's saying, Brother George, she's got a place. But it doesn't say that that place is stationary. She's got wings, why? So she can outfly that dragon. Next verse talks about him as a serpent. She's got wings from God to what? Mount up on wings as eagles. To escape, but you can't fly for forever. You need a place. But God is always going to have a place. But sometimes that place is for a time. Sometimes that place is for times, plural. You may revisit. It says, and half a time. Sometimes it's shorter than others. But however long she needs to rest and to be nourished and to be ready to evade the serpent one more time, God says he's always going to have a place for her. Place is, place, do not know. How long are they going to stay there? Well, sometimes it's going to be a time. Sometimes it's going to be time. Sometimes it's going to be half a time. But however long they need, God's got a place set aside for them right, a cleft in the rock if you will where he can put his hand over them and what the devil can't get to them but for three and a half years he's going to be trying everything he can to get to them eventually he rallies the whole world against them then it says in verse number 15 the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood and the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth it says and if brother Jordan can turn the page swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ what they do he tries everything it says that he opened his mouth and cast forth a flood where'd that flood come from from himself y'all remember the seals and the trumpets that we've already talked about before this all the things that the devil can dream up the things he's been preparing in hell that God's allowed him to prepare for the time of Armageddon that's just what he does in his free time here it says that he's wroth and he's angry he's throwing every last trick he's got and it says even when he musters up the ability to cast a giant flood after him now whether that's a literal flood or whether that's a metaphorical flood brother Jordan does not know because God did not say but I know that the earth helped the woman out What's that mean? God used the earth to swallow up whatever was coming after him. We already told you when that last trumpet sounded back in chapter number 11, that last verse says there's voices, earthquakes. Like it, what, it was all natural phenomena. The earth rejoiced because they heard Jesus was coming back. The earth itself hates the devil. You know why? Because of his deception, sin not only entered into man, but upon the face of the world. It was also corrupted due to the deception of the devil. So what's it say? It says, ha ha, take this. Helps out the woman fleeing in the wilderness. Even though he's the, quote-unquote, only one left, the only power upon the face of the earth, he still can't even control the earth. Why? Because he's not God. It says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, 
What's happening? Things are lining up for the battle of Armageddon. That's what's happening. He says, the remnants of her seed. There's so many of them that he couldn't get. But what's he want to get? He just wants to get as many as he can. Wants to make them pay for his mistake. But he's wroth. Full of anger. And we learn a little bit more about those in the wilderness. It says that they keep the commandments of God. He doesn't care. If you're one of God's people and you're not doing the things of God, he's got you exactly where he wants you to be. You're useless. He says he's going after the remnant that what? Keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. He's trying to remove every last reminder. He's just got a short time to do what? To be in charge. And what's the one thing that he has desired from the beginning? He wants to be able to forget about God and Christ and he wants to be the big man in the room. Since the beginning, that's all he's wanted. He's a prima donna. He's a diva. He likes the limelight and he doesn't want anybody else to have it. Well, there's just one problem. Long before he ever existed, God made him. He wasn't even in the limelight when he was made. He thought everybody, when he would play all the music, it says that he was full of instruments. He could do it all on his own. But as he played the music in glory, he thought that all eyes were on him. No, no, no. All eyes were on Christ. It's where his eyes should have been. He thought that his music was so good he deserved some attention. Before there was ever anything, God walked out and stepped on nothing and made everything. Before Genesis even starts, it says, In the beginning was the heaven and the earth. God made that before he said, Let there be light. What did he make it out of? What he wanted. Who did he make it for? Himself. Why? Because he's God. Every day the devil has to wake up. Well, if he goes to sleep. But give me the, give me the, the leeway to make the metaphor. Every day he's got to admit, I'm not God. You know when he goes to accuse the brethren before God, he's still got to bow down before God. You know every time that he makes an appearance in heaven, he's got to lower himself and humble himself before the throne of God. Because right, you don't get to where God is without lowering yourself first. Every second of every day, he goes to check his pocket and he says, oh, I don't, I don't have my keys. Why? Because Jesus took him when he rose victorious over death and hell. He's got to walk around to a house that Jesus kicked the front door off the hinges. The devil thought he had it locked up tight. Anybody that was in there with him, they couldn't get out. In fact, they were expanding. They were making more room. The Bible does say that hell enlarges their borders. Why? Because man was never intended to go there. They have to make more room to put people there. But Jesus said, nope, give me the keys back. And he's like, yeah, but I took these with me from heaven. When I came down here, he says, yeah, we, I came to get them back. They weren't yours in the first place. And you know, what, you know what the devil said when Jesus said, hand me the keys? He said, yes, Lord. Bowed before him. You know what he's going to do by the end of this book? He's going to bow before the Lord and proclaim that he's Lord of Lord and King of Kings, just like everybody else. He's always known it. But for a short time, he gets to play with the idea that, wait, the Holy Ghost has been removed. God pulled the goalkeeper. There's nobody in the net. He took all of his people out of here. The only ones that are left are those that are hiding in the woods. Let's go kill them and let's have a party. I'll be in charge, finally. There's one problem. It never happens that way. You'd think that he knows the end of this book. You'd think, right, that from the beginning God's told him he can't win. You'd think he'd believe him eventually. That's how warped and twisted. We think that people's minds are warped and twisted. Lucifer's mind's twisted far worse than anybody else's. He's not insane. 
He's just bought into his own lies so much that he'll believe it to the end. Is it any wonder that people do crazy things when they buy into the logic of a crazy devil? No. The Bible says that a man cannot serve two masters. Love one and hate the other. If you love the ways of the world, if you love the ways of Satan, it's going to make you crazy. Maybe not lunatic, maybe not to where you don't know where you are and you don't know who people are, but it's going to pervert the way that you think, that you act, and you live. You look at people and you think, how in the world? They know that that's bad for them. They know that that's not good. Don't take out a loan with like a 200% interest rate on it. That's dumb. But yet people do it all the time. Or people go to those payday advance stores. You know what those are designed to do? To keep you on the hook. To where you can never pay it off. Well, Brother Jordan, if people know this, why do they do it? Because people will believe anything if it's convenient for them. You know what the devil's believing in this chapter? That it's convenient for him to get rid of every last trace of God so that he can be the big man on campus. He says that he knows he only has a little while. He knows it's not going to last. He just wants to win for a little bit. He'd say it was worth it all to say that I beat God for two seconds. He's just trying to poke one hole through the holiness of, and the righteousness of God to say God's not all that He's cracked up to be. Don't you hate playing games against people like that? Well, I'm going to lose, but I'm going to take it to the bitter end. If you're as competitive as the foster family, if you play like that, there's a good chance you're going to get a shoe thrown at you, and then we're going to make you quit the game. Because I already won. You know that I've won. Admit that I've won. No. We're going to drag this out. But I'm going to make you take everything from me. Well, God already has it all anyway. He can do and take it all from him. What he's saying, Brother Jordan, he's trying every last thing. He's taking every pl play out of his playbook to do what? Just to try and be God for half a second. For a moment. Knowing he's never going to do it, but that's his hope. And it says to make war with the remnant of his... For so long he's been accusing us. Why? Because God's had his hedged in. Can't touch us. God, they don't deserve to have the hedge around them. To take Job's story. God, you've put a hedge too thick around him. I can't get to him. Well, what if I took the hedge away? Well, if I take everything that he owns, he won't love you the same. That there's a problem. Job still loved him the same. And he said, all right, fine. He loved you more than he loved his, but, but if you let me touch his body, God says you can have everything but his life. Guess what? Job still says, the Lord give it, the Lord take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Came into the world naked. I'm going out naked. Can't take anything with me. God let me have it for a little bit. Hallelujah. But God's still God. Instead of accusing, instead of tempting, now he'll be able to put his plan into action, which is what? To destroy. Isn't that what one of the names... He was called earlier in this book, Abaddon, Apollyon, Destroyer. He's going to try. Not going to win. We already just saw it in the verses before this. The woman's going to have a safe place, a haven, for as long as she needs it. He's not going to be able to touch her, but he's sure going to try. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.